Hi, my name is Marty Webb. I'm the Chief Community Impact Officer here at TechSoup, and I'm also CEO of Caravan Studios, which is the division of TechSoup that's responsible for working with communities and building out a variety of technology and digital solutions. Our mission at this organization as a whole is to build a bridge that helps leverage technology so that organizations working hard on the ground to enact social change can benefit from a wide variety of digital solutions to achieve their goals. Today's webinar is actually a great example of the kind of connections that we're working to build. At TechSoup, we've been very engaged with data and public data in a large variety of ways over time. We worked on a multi-year grant-funded project in Brazil that was making libraries be the center place of connection to public data. In the United States, we use government published data and a little app that I love dearly called Range, which shows school-age youth the best place that they can get a free meal during the summertime when their schools are closed. Um, and our now retired Net Squared program, one of the things that brought Eli to us, actually, who's on this call as well, and you'll see him pop up in the community. It, the first things that we did in that program was ask people how they were using public data and working to create what we were then calling, because it was like 12 years ago, mashups of data to help describe what was going on in communities. And what we learned in all of that work is that it is necessary to effectively use public data. It's important and it's incredibly hard. And today, what we want to spend some time talking about is exactly how it is that nonprofits have the potential of using public data to support their storytelling and their goals and the efforts that are going on right now to make it easier for organizations to be able to access and use public data and a project that we'd like to work on with all of you actually to make it even easier still. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first of two speakers. Het Maldonado Reyes is the Director of Research Development and Analytics at Tech Impact. Het is sitting at Tech Impact's Data Innovation Lab, which is based at the University of Delaware's FinTech Innovation Hub. And they engage data scientists as fellows and work on a wide variety of social good projects. Our second speaker today is gonna be RV Guha, a Google fellow and the founder of the Data Commons Project, which is gonna be a big part of the project that we're talking about. Guha has brought many innovations to the web, including the first version of RSS, which is a service that at its core allows us to subscribe to updates from websites and is one of the founders of schema.org. Heck, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get started and talk a little bit about why public data and this kind of data is useful for nonprofit organizations. Good morning and hi everyone. First and foremost, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation and really hear what y'all are thinking. I, let me just start with a little bit about myself. My name is Heck Maldonado Reese, like Marnie mentioned. I'm based here in Wilmington, Delaware, but we really have a reach across the U.S. and different. I'm the director of research development and analytics at our data innovation lab. But Tech Impact really oversees everything in technology and data for social good. So we have a different, a different collection in the terms of data and technology, and we like putting them together and realizing what we can do as solutions. So for today's talk, we do a lot of our work with nonprofit and government. And so the perception and framework that I have for the talk today really is about that space. So just to get us situated on conversation, when I think about nonprofit spaces, I can think about different types of organizations, but we, many of us work with communities, right? So I see these pillars in green, you see them above, I see them as internal and in orange, I see them as external, but in the center and core to the work we do are our programs, right? The activities, the outputs, the outcomes, all the impact we do, it's really centered around our programs. However, there are different reasons as to why every single one of these, let's call them pillars, would want to leverage data or technology for social good. So focusing on data, I'll walk through some of the examples a bit later on, but thinking about data, I just want you to, as we're going forward, in think and include the reality that organization across different levels of the organization and different domains is able to utilize data and create a culture around data that benefit the organization at different capacities. And we'll walk through some of those next. So just to start, let me just speak to some of the more like concepts of mode of why we, we do analytics and how we utilize public data. Really importantly, I think that there, there are different frameworks that individuals can think about, but for me, these four cover really 
deeply the reasons and actions as to why we would analyze public data, right? First being to diagnose. You can think about that, whether that's diagnosing an issue within the organization, thinking about like operational, is something taking too long? Are we not meeting the need? Really, we really don't know what it is, right? And the second being to describe is really to go deeper and think about that diagnosis, for example, or a problem or an issue or success for that matter. Oftentimes we get to prediction and this is where it starts becoming a little bit more technologically and data advanced in the sense that Predictions can be either naive or they can be models. There can be a lot of complications that go into them and our communities are complex. So predictions are a difficult space to make them valid overall. It's not impossible, it just requires more leveraging. And then prescribing really is to suggest, right? A lot of this, I see it as an ordinal pathway in terms of data maturity. As we mature, we move into more and more of the right side of this, of this range. But in general, there's still aspects of it that we do across the whole lifespan of an organization and the program. Those are the modes as to the reasons, right? And I share those first because I always like asking individuals to think about why are we doing this, right? And I think that really importantly, having those four names, diagnose, predict, prescribe, and report, those are really describing those are really important. However, we have a motive to the work that we do from an, from an organizational standpoint, and it's both about the reason we're doing our works, thinking about what are our theories, what are our practices, right? But also how are we going at the opposite end and finding that translation of our work? So I really summarize it in the sense of operating, reporting, and targeting. Those are the three main motives that we do analytics. Particularly examples of operating are when we do data collection, right? Or process enhancement. Much of that is to enhance a process flow or make sure that we're being efficient or meeting and reporting then really thinks about evaluating outcomes, programs, tracking project progress, right? Even from a different standpoint, not from the administration of the project, but maybe the length of the project, patients, and clients for that matter. And lastly, targeting. When we really think about it, we do a lot of different work, but it's important to also stand and look at our work at certain periods that make sense for our model and think about, are we using our resources effectively? Do we still need to submit our resources to where they are? And really thinking about your whole organization's data infrastructure, right? All, all the different departments, whether that's development and all the individual programs, there might be multiple pieces that could help you answer that question in the best fashion. And so to give you an example of what these look like more in, 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 in tangible, I'm going to give you a quick brief example for each one of these of some of the work that we've done on a personal end. And I'm just hoping that it sparks some ideas, but really it's about the philosophy and really the culture on data behind it, that there are reasons we do these operationally, right? So this example itself is an operation example, and it's an example that really the goal here is we have a new email and we want to automate storing that information somewhere, right? This could be specifically on SharePoint. The examples are very valid. We are able to create a process and off the first cup, we might not think that there's analytics behind this, but really thinking about it, you can then start adding layers of what something like this could look like for every single individual in a program. And then you can really start thinking about the load of distribution of those emails that that person is receiving. If those emails translate into more engagement, that maybe might be something that that person's also receiving. And does that say that your program has to expand in support, or is it just a function of the, the process that is today? So there's different stages and there's a lot of things, uh, there's a lot of information that can come from what not is. And I always tell individuals that for me personally, I like separating the concepts of data and information because information can be almost everywhere, not just in numbers. And so that's really the perception here on operations. But I think that really importantly, adding and adding that value is seen a little bit differently when we're doing reporting, right? So. We do reasons of data to, to be able to move into operations, but for reporting, here's an example of a social impact report for a community-based organization that we work with, who is a community revitalization organization. They have pillars of success, but in the back end, there's a bunch of different analytics that are happening just in this front end have different domains of concept. Now, for this specifically, what you're looking at right now is a executive summary and we're in a presentation. But if you were to have access to this documentation in the back end, they're able to highlight data and just really create a story for what their work is and be able to determine the priorities that they want to set from that standpoint. And the small difference here is that initially operation was an internal thing to your organization, but reporting could be different for different organizations as could operations. The last that I'll touch upon is, for example, Pardon me, Tari. In the sense here, we have a map of distributions. This is some work that we did with, with a group here in our state. And really what you're looking at is a distribution of maps, right? I think that importantly is that this isn't simply just 
outcomes or outputs. It's really thought through in terms of the geography. And also just thinking about what the data that was needed and what are the different layers of data. So if you were to able to jump into this documentation, there are different layers of movements of data and layers that you can add to understand or explore some ideas you might have. So with that all being said, I just to summarize, really, there are different reasons why we do analytics. There are different reasons we can take advantage of analytics for, and there are different buckets or containers, let's say, to promote us to want to leverage public access data and civic data. So with all that being said, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, but excited to be on the rest of the call. That's great. Heck, and just a couple of quick questions for you, and then we'll uh, transition to Guha. And again, folks, please feel free to drop comments into the chat, questions in, into the Q&A. Heck, when you're describing those, the four pillars, the sort of maturity of an organization's ability to manage data, certainly what we find for TechSoup that, that our answer as to which pillar we're in is all of work. And how do organizations think about how they prioritize and move themselves along, knowing that they're always getting in new data and having new needs? And it's not just like this relentless forward progress. Yeah, no, thanks for that question, Marnie. That's a great point. Right? I mentioned it as a being sequential, but there is this intrinsic kind of like we're moving along. So that's valid. I think that for me specifically, there's three major right, domains. And I would think it's about really your data, your technology, and your goals, right? So understanding where you are in the maturity of your data, do you know where your processes are? Depending on whether you have a tech team or not, there's different stages of where you are for engagement. So I think that really understanding where you are in that process from your data and technology standpoint would really align as to whether or not you're ready to prescribe, right? Maybe you need a different space in the cloud to be able to store all that data to do predictions. Maybe we're not there yet, but can we still prepare for that while also doing some of the other work? I think that's where that third point of like strategy would come into play from a more like goal standpoint overall. I'm not sure that answers your question, but that- That does. That's great. Thank you. And then I think the other thing, and just as we s segue to- Uha is going to be sharing more about Data Commons specifically. Data Commons is an enormous repository of public data. You were talking about data the organization owns. Can you talk just a little bit about like your last example there with targeting and the map? It yeah. seems like having one's data organized in a dependable way makes it easier to reflect against public data and see where there may be discrepancies, where your population may be different than the population as a whole, or it can support you in some prediction. Is that the main way organizations being able to reflect against these public data repositories, or are there other things? That's a, that's a central way, and I think that's a really valid point, right? It allows you to connect that. But I think that on a separate standpoint, it also allows for not just targeting, but also reprioritizing. There's both the re targeting and demand in a way, right? Who are your clients? And I think that's where public data really comes into play. There's vast information at HUD, open, like the census, that you can really understand who are your target populations and how they move over the years and over the geographies. So I think that really taking that standpoint, yes, there is a composition, but then also you can fold that into your internal organization's data, right? If you have a program that's for youth, maybe you don't want to target a zip code that has zero, zero people under the age of 18. Maybe that's the decision making that you're utilizing. It is a value of knowing where to go or where to market or where to reach. That's really the different stages. Great. Thank you. And I'm sure that we'll have more questions as we go. I think with that context about thinking about our own organizational data, how we've organized it so we can start to better work with and participate in public data, I'll switch over to Guha, who will talk now about datacommons.org more specifically and making that public data more just accessible and query. So to set the context, as Marnie and others pointed out, there's a lot of data out there. This data is essential for everything, but using this data is incredibly painful. It involves data wrangling that is expensive and it's repeated over and over again. In fact, there's an analogy with this than satellite imagery. In the late 90s, NASA had a Landsat imagery up on its website. If you wanted to, in theory, you could figure out what your house was like from the sky. In practice, it was so difficult, very few people did. And all that Google Maps and Earth really did, at least in its first iterations, was it did the data wrangling once and for all, and that literally changed the way we look at the world around us. We have a similar situation today with data. Imagine you want to find out which California counties are most at full risk from climate change. 
The data to answer this exists out there, but it's so difficult to track it down, put it all together and so on. Very few people can effectively do it. Imagine a world you could just ask for this in natural language, in English, and you start getting the answers. That's the vision we've been working towards for the last five years. Our approach is to do all this data wrangling once and for all so that the costs are amortized. We've taken a very large number of different data sources. We've done the cleaning. We've done the built open schemas on top of schema.org. We've aligned references to ATTs and so on. We've built this giant knowledge graph. This thing is too big for most people to download. So we provide APIs on top of which many different applications can be built. Everything we do is open source. There is cloud-based infrastructure for storing, serving these knowledge graphs as a suite of visualization tools. Most of the work has been on the data itself. Demographics, economics, health, food, crime, education. There's a lot of data around climate change and sustainability, climate, energy, water, agriculture, and so on. To give you an idea of the scale of this piece, it's about three and a half billion plus time series. It's about five times the size of FRED. FRED is the St. Louis Federal Reserve's economic database that the U.S. Federal Reserve and other entities use for their decision making. We already have a bunch of applications and you could play around with this. You could go to Google search today and do something like unemployment benefits in California or unemployment rate in California. And this data comes from data commons or more complicated things like the number of poor Hispanic women in San Clara County. There's a ton of these queries that you can ask and get answers for all this data that you see around, but statistical data that you see on global search results page, mostly comes from data commons. Let me actually focus on one particular thing today, which is on helping community service organizations. There's sort of two facets of this. There's a physical world where the real work happens, you know, food distribution, building shelters, and so on and so forth. And there's the other side, there's the information world, understanding who is most at what kind of risk, reducing waste, and even things like carbon accounting. The context is that there are many inequities, and you'd like to find out what are these inequities so that they can be better served. All of this data, every, all the charts that I'm going to show you today, it's, are from data commons, and they can be, you can go explore them today at data commons. For example, this is a county level distribution of the fraction of the population with disabilities. And we can see there are people in Puerto Rico, people in Kentucky, and people in counties in um, uh, New Mexico, where over 30% of the population is disabled. There are places, this is people with diabetes. These are, again, you can see there are alarming rates of diabetes in pockets in this country. Or people without health insurance. And in this day and age, it's really sad that there are people in Ohio and South Dakota where 40% of the population is without health insurance. And then on top of all this, we have new factors such as climate change. Climate change is especially interesting because it's a great example of the data is public, but sure, go ahead, download 70,000 plus net CDF files from IPCC and try and process them. Good news is we've done all that work. We've mapped it to, to counties, states, and so on. And now we can find climate change. We often talk about climate change as 1.5 degrees versus 2 degrees. And with this, we can understand that it's not that simple. This is a map visualization of temperatures in June of 2050 to the temperatures in 2006, June, June 20, uh, 2006, according to one particular very popular NASA model. And you can see there are places in this country, and this is based on what is called RCP 2.6, which corresponds to roughly 1.8 degree temperature change on average. Even in this situation, optimistic situation, there are places in Kansas that are going to be warmer with seven degrees centigrade and other places in places in Montana, which are going to be get cooled by four degrees centigrade, this difference. And when those kind of large differences occur, we know that these different kinds of inequities are going to be worse. And we have to identify who is most at what kind of risk so that we can go help them. And to identify that, we need data not just about climate, but data about health, food, water, farming, employment, and so much more. Unfortunately, this data is across a gradually in different silos, just at the U.S. federal level. And when you start getting into state and county data, it's an absolute challenge in order to be able to deal with it. And somebody needs to go organize this and make it easily accessible, which, as you might guess, is Google's mission, and that's what they do. But because this is so important, we've decided to do this in an open fashion and make the, all the data open. 
not just are we making the data open, we're making the entire software stack open. Not just that, we're making the entire process by which we build this database open in that it takes place on GitHub. And so anybody can help participate in building this. If all of covered, a num large number of different topics from climate and water and health and all of these and many more. And of course, they'll be covering them to greater detail across the world, et cetera, et cetera. But it's best to show you a simple example of the kind of thing that we're trying to do. This is one of our visualization tools. The x-axis is the same temperature difference that I spoke about, which is according to one model between 2050 and 2000. The y-axis is the prevalence of coronary heart disease across counties. And then the important thing to note is I'm, I'm pulling together data from widely different agencies and widely different things as though it were all in a single database. So coming back to the chart, each dot here is a U.S. county. And what's interesting here is not the correlation or lack thereof, but the counties to the token point. You see this red rectangle, there are counties there in South Dakota and other counties in New Mexico and so on, which have a high prevalence of coronary heart and we experience an incredibly high temperature rise. And coronary heart disease becomes much worse as temperature increases. And we have to prepare in order to help them. And in order to do that, we need data about a whole bunch of different things. These counties, I'll pick one of those counties as the Ogdala County. They have a very high level rate of uninsured. They have incredibly high levels, 25% levels of poverty. Even their housing is not as good as many of the comparable counties across it. And you got to get the bigger picture. It's interestingly, it's a very young population. They have a very low labor force population and incredibly low levels of college education. The point is that if somebody, some policymaker, some community service organization is trying to figure out how to help them, how do they get hold of all this data? And on the data commons side, we have these things called place pages for every single place. So this is all of Lala County. And you can look at everything from the median income, how it's changed, the unemployment, the poverty levels, the health conditions, the various health behaviors, equity, income, education, demographics, and so much more. I encourage you to figure out enter the place wherever you are calling in from and see what we have to say about that. Every single place in the U.S. has this level of detail. Most places across the world have something or the other about them. The one last point is that the model is not a single data com, one ring to bind them all, but the model is much more like the, as Heck and Amani uh, pointed out, Many different organizations have data that they cannot necessarily share with the outside world. And so like the web, you have many different websites. You use the same web browser and the same model applies over here. You can set up your own data commons. And when you do, when you select your own data commons, the interesting thing is you can use all the visualization tools I showed you with your data commons. Not only that, all of the data that is in our data commons is available to your data commons without actually copying. Over. And the best way to show this is actually an example. One of our close friends at Feeding America, and many of you, I'm sure all of you, America has been put up a data commons for feedingamerica.org, which you could go visit. The Feeding America has this meal gap in this. It's their private data. And understandably, they don't want to just take it and add it with the rest of the data commons. And so their data commons has only this meal gap data. But the way data commons architecture is set up, that data can now easily be combined with the rest of the data in the thing, main data commons. So we can actually answer the question that I raised right at the beginning. California counties that are most at food risk. The x-axis here is the food insecurity index feeding America. The y-axis is the measure of the temperature, expected temperature of rise. And each dot here is a California county. And you get an idea of the counties that are most at food risk. Ironically, it's the actual cultural counties that are most important risk. And it's not just that one particular metric. You could go in here and look at other things like, I was talking about cardiac health, right? Cardiac health and food insecurity across the U.S. That's a correlation over here. And if you say you're not interested in cardiac health, you want to look into something else, you have all of these variables over here that you can play around with. Let's assume you want to look at something like the people without health insurance and food insecurity. Right. And the whole point is that it should be this fast. And here we want to go for a capita. That's a correlation. 
And it should be that fast across all of these things. And you bring your private data in here and you should be able to compare and play around with all of these things. We recognize that it's still all of these interfaces are built by engineers for geeks. So that's why we're partnering with the so, so that, that we can better understand the need, data needs of community service organizations and build tools that are much more easily usable for the range of things that you're applying. I can go on talking about this and we've been working on this for five years, but I'll take a pause and if there's questions, I'll take them. There are a few questions. So let me just go through some of them here and then get through as many. And then I have a, a, a couple I'd like to throw at the two of you. So one from Tom Brown, I've downloaded the Data Commons Python library and found the documentation. Tom works internationally. Is the data set primarily targeted to United States data? No, the data is, that's a great question. The data is not, we have a lot of data about the US. We have a lot of data about India. We have less data about the rest of the world, but the plan is to have greater depth. The U.S. just happens to have an insane, uh, incredible level of data because of the Commerce Department. And many other places in the world don't have that much data openly available, but to the extent possible, we're trying to build it out. And in fact, you can help us build it out. You can see all our processes on GitHub and you can submit the R's and add and live on to it. Great. And then another question coming in from... Just, just uh, one actual important point. All of the charts, everything that you see on Data Commons uh, site, you can embed those charts any way you want. You can get, you can export the data behind those charts. The whole thing is meant to be just to take it and put it wherever you want, do whatever you want. Right. Very specific question from PJ around incarceration rates by zip code. Yeah, we have those sad data, but we don't have those. Let me show the crime rate, please. I'm just going to show you, show you. We have crime rate, incarceration rates and release, in prisoner population and all this. Is, yeah, it's happened. I don't know whether we have it by zip code. We certainly have it by county and I can look into whether we have it by zip code. You can send an email to data comment support and somebody will answer you. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then there's another question about. Let me add to one more thing. Often this kind of a question comes up often. You could go to something called the Statistical Variable Explorer. You could go here and then incarceration rates, releases, durations, and things. So it's just this. Go to the point earlier of a question in chat about what's a triple. This data isn't just at the incarceration rate level, but it's also broken down into more layers. You see, yeah, yeah. So we have this at the, some of this at the state level, yeah. Not at the zip code level, but we should. If you have it. In a lot of these things, if you have a source and you could tell us, we could import it. That's great. That's great. The other question is that that's in here is one of the other questions that in here is just one commenting how great the website is and wondering how often the data is updated. And I'm assuming this varies, right? A lot of it depends on the source, but I think that is an important question. Source aside, Absolutely. how so, is the data updated and maintained? Some data gets updated every week like the Bureau of Labor Statistics data. Some of it gets updated every year and some, some other census is uh, updated only every five years because that's sort of something which is, to the extent possible, as soon as the data is publicly available, we update. There are some older data sets in earlier than the, that were added earlier in the history of the project where the auto-update mechanism isn't set up, but for most of the newer ones, there's an auto-update mechanism where as soon as the data is updated within a few hours or the next few days, it gets updated. Great. So we have another question in here, which is how is Data Commons different from Tableau? Tableau is a fantastic suite of tools for visualizing the data itself. And there are data libraries over there, but it's not trying to take all of the public data and give you a single view, allow you to present it's one single database. The focus area is completely different. We happen to have some visualization tools. Tableau has this fantastic MS visualization tools. And we're trying to figure out how to put them up together and so on. So the data commons is not primarily a visualization tool. It's primarily a way to access that data, query it, export it, and then you can use it in combination with data visualization tools. Exactly. Exactly. There's, in fact, data commons is using in data science courses all over the place for where it's used with Python notebooks and things like that. There's no visual, little or no visualization. That's great. One of our team, if you can drop in the data commons email address to get help, that would be awesome. That was a question in here. And I'm wondering, Guha, if you could just walk us through, because there are a few different questions about how you find the data with regard to geography. I wonder if you could just 
walk us through that one more time where you start sure. I, the, the a, the, and look at that. Yeah. So a, a very simple thing to do would be to go to, if you go to the, you to the go to the intercom and or and I go into one of these tools, I can pick the place it's in order, which is a good one. Uh, you grew up in San Diego, right? I did. San Diego, California, into that, and you get a whole bunch of stuff, I will say. And then these things have entry points into other data, like to explore more. If you want to look at how something in San Diego has changed about how median household equity, medium household income by race has changed in San Diego over the years, you can click on explore more, you get taken to a dozen tools, and you can see what happens over here. Or you can stay with the San Diego too, staying over here. There's, you can drill down further into particular zip codes. You can go up further into the county level. And there's also a map tool, which that's a lot of people like. So for example, if you go over to the map explorer and you say, I want to look at the distribution of some variable across U.S. counties in your, or U.S. states, or U.S. or U.S. state counties, and you want to pick any variable over here. You want to look at something like I'm going to pick health conditions. You want to look at us. One is a variable. Click on that, and that gives you an idea of what the distribution of us went around. Please. This also, these, as you enter these geos, these variables update so that you get to show only the variables for that geo. And things. Does that give you an idea? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say before launching into some more of these questions that. The project that we have the opportunity to engage on it in collaboration with our colleagues at Data Innovation Lab with Tech Impact and with Wuhan team at Data Commons is to say, how do we make this massive data set with all of these trillions and triples and everything else available and accessible to organizations? So a lot of the questions we're seeing is, how do I drill down on the data? How do I export the data so I can use it? If I'm using the data in something, how do I cite the data? How do I compare data in two different counties? One of the things that we want to do is surface all of those questions so that we can provide regular sustainable answers to that. And also, like the instance that Pa showed that the team did with Feeding America, are there are opportunities for us to go from all of those demographics that you see there on the side of the screen. We just see the things under health. But each one of those pluses means there's more demographics we can look at underneath that yep. and, and then more underneath that. Is there a way that we can say, okay, for the problem of climate change, we think these are the most relevant ones. Let's make a data commons instance that's focused on that and then provide training so organizations working in that area have a way to be able to download and export that data, manipulate and use it, potentially even combine it with their own data in relatively simple to use tools like spreadsheets. I think that a lot of this is about how do we make this enormous resource approachable and usable for organizations. So th this webinar isn't the only opportunity to ask these questions and get them answered. That's actually the whole point of them. Figure out what you need so that we can support data commons. We, Tech Impact and TechSoup, can support data commons in making this available and usable for organizations of all sizes. And they can really go in and play with it and tell meaningful stories using this public data that they can explore and target services, that they can demonstrate to funders why it's different in their county than in other counties or why it's different for the experience of a particular group of people is different from the experience of another group of people. And making this as, a, as available and useful as possible. I said, well, keep going. If, if I may add something over there. Yes, yes. This is exactly right, which is that there's, that's, the tools that I showed you are sort of general tools, which are often just too difficult to use. But we do have a, a toolkit with which we build things like, this is an equity dashboard. Then it's the any geo, it picks out a small number of variables and gives them to you in a dashboard. And the hope that we have in working with TechSoup is that we will identify a small number of areas, hunger, homelessness, and so on, for which we could pick out the right variables that make most sense and then present them so that anybody can use them in a really simple fashion. Yeah. And our goal is, can we do something where we make these data, public data dashboards for organizations? So we say not to limit them, but to provide a starting place. 
yeah. and actually demonstrate how to do some of those comparisons or queries and also support organizations in being able to download that data and use it in their own visualizations in slide decks that they might share with their boards or with their funders or to be include some of that as they do outreach and work in their own decision making. So again, I think a lot of the questions you all are asking are exactly what we're looking at answering with this project and the kind of information that you are chiming in on about the desire to be able to break down the data by zip codes, for example. A lot of people are plus oneing that. And the and zip code is nice. So I don't know if it's zip code you lived in morning, but I'll take my I, don't, I no longer remember. So like this is zip code 91911 that just looked yeah. nice. And so, yep, you get it all there. Just clear zip code there. It's That's great. And so we'll be like, this is a lot of what the follow-up of this project is going to be. Make a couple of other questions I want to pull out of here. Somebody asked, how are the details about the queries protected? So when we they put in searches or they download data or other things like that, I'm assuming the protection there and tell them, feel free to drop more detail in the chat if I misrepresent your question, but it's about the privacy of the person doing the queries. And I so suspect- there is no login, right? On this site, we just get the data. Okay. It's only that you need API access that you have a key there okay, because one of the own thing we need to know what the kind of queries are happening, but otherwise there is no login of the data coming site. And then yeah. Tom Shipman, your question about tools and learning resources for people, organizations who are not as tech savvy. That's exactly what this project is about building, actually, 100%. It's starting to get engaged with the conversation. The 200 people that have been on this call at various points in time say, what's the data that you need and what are the skills that you need to be able to manipulate that data and useful and what are the tools that can make you ideally need to use those skills maybe less because the tool gets you closer to the end state that you need it to be in. So all of that is very much what we're focusing the, this project on. So there's- If I may answer a couple of these questions, there's a question from Lila C. Do we modify the data to make one data set relatable? We don't modify the data. Sometimes we have to ag- aggregate it, et cetera. We do a lot of normalizing of the actual format. One of the, you know, one is a CSV, one is the tab limited, one is some net CDF and so on. So we clean up the data, but we don't modify it at all. It is in, for every single data point that you get the entire provenance change, so you can. That's great. Were there others in there you wanted to pick off? Through, uh... Just look through them. There's a lot of like, People suggesting data sources, you yeah. have to get them. And then if you're, if you are more enthusiastic and you'd like us, like to help adding that data to data commons or setting up your own data commons, please let us know. Hey, Marnie, I just wanted to jump in on, on, on a point of, it, it's really valuable to go downward from an exploratory standpoint, right? And this tool itself shows you the ability, the questions that are coming up about zip code and granularity is really important. But I think it could also help from a standpoint, somebody asked a question about how do I use this for an organization just to identify something from the beginning, right? I think that it's also useful for that strategic vision of how do we even start? Sometimes a place might not have resources and a foundation might be the place that's trying to make that decision, right? Or any other aspect. So it applies to different types of nonprofits, but I think really importantly, it's a top-down approach and a down-up approach as well is really what's possible from here. And, ex- and to the uh, auxiliary is the integration to your data, but I think that really internally it allows for that big picture view. So I just wanted to highlight those two, like that, that, that it is possible both directions and a mixture in between as well. A- absolutely. And I think the other thing that, that we often talk about with the organizations that we work with is that quite often the data that the data on a particular community or a particular need, whether it's a ge- geography, whether it's a group of people, whether it's a particular issue area, actually, we have most of the data. We nonprofit organizations have most of the data because the data that we're using is not well captured by governments or businesses in public data. So that's exactly the places we are often stepping in and helping. One of the things that we will also want to surface as a part of this project is where, what are other data sources? Gumba was talking about that earlier so that they can be ingested. But are there opportunities for us as a community to aggregate the data that we hold so that it can be explored in comparable ways, not personally identifiable ways, but in these kind of numerical and time series ways so that we can contribute our understanding of the lived experiences of the individuals that we work with 
as part of these decision-making and bigger tools, because so often we are the ones collecting the data. One of the projects that we worked on a while ago was, a, was an air quality project in Colombia, and they put up these small coffee cup sized air quality sensors in public places. And that project held most of the air quality data in some of the communities because there just weren't other public resources collecting it. And so I think this is also an opportunity for us to say, where can we as a collective community contribute to these general conversations? I want to, I want to just give a chance both Heck and Gupa for you to round out and say what you hope the possibilities from working on this and what you have just shared some of mine, what you, some of the possibilities of working on this project are. And then I'll close out by making sure folks know where they can read more about this project and how can they can get more engaged if they'd like to. So Heck, maybe starting with you, what are, the, what are your hopes and dreams? Sure. Thanks, Marty. I think that I'll answer that twofold. The first perhaps is that I really hope this project creates a space for organizations that are doing the field work and the community-based work to be able to free up some of their times to de dedicate more of that resourcing to that, right? And data will help maybe figure out what are those resources issues that you could prioritize. From a second standpoint, I would love to see a collaborative kind of built from this to your point, right? We have the primary source of data. So how do we start measuring what is a typical model that is in this particular space? I mean, how are we being successful? And can we utilize that data to understand our both this big picture data that comes from everywhere and how can we connect that? So those two ways, supporting organizations do their work and then creating a collective that allows for people to come together in that space. Great, thank you. Guha? Another the collaboration with uh, texting, but one of the origins was I was having lunch with this good friend of mine, this amazing human being called Emily Ma. And Emily was, you know, was going on and on about all this data we have and all these tools we have. And she was telling me about the story of the father-in-law who runs a food pantry in a small town in West Texas. And she's like, he spent his time between taking the food and making it available and driving around and writing grant proposals. He does not have time or the ability or the skill levels to deal with your interface or marvel at its wonders. And I realized that in order to actually have impact, the data needs to be made available in an easy to use fashion by the people who need it. And, and then what introduced to you guys, and because you know the needs of the people who need the data, right? And so my hope is that questions like, I wonder what this thing is, or, oh my God, I got to go pull all this data from these different places for doing a presentation to my funders or to the next grant proposals and all of these things. You spend less, have to spend less time with doing that. If we could enable that would be, you would have accomplished your things. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. And I'll just end by telling you quickly where you can find some more information and the goals. And then there have been a couple requests we'll have for one, one more demo of how you go through and find the data and then where the extract is so that you can download. So maybe you can. So I, let me actually show you a slightly different tool, which is okay. you want to download the data. You go to this data download tool, and then you could pick a particular place. Like in this case, let me go back. Just the United States, and then you can say, I want to pick things by county or in a zip code, which is what you wanted, right? And then this is all the data that is available. So let's assume we want to pick something as simple as the median age and median income. And then you preview this, takes a couple of seconds because it's actually pulling in a ton of data from different places. And then once it's done with that, you get a download button at the bottom, which you download. There you go. That's your data that you download and you get a CSV. This is one of our tools. There are other tools over here. I'd start off with the Data Commons homepage and just spend some time exploring these tools. To get stuck, send an email to datacommons-support at datacommons-support at datacommons.org. And then the link should be here somewhere. And then let, let us know how we can help. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And to the point that Sam made in here, this project is very much about figuring out how we support nonprofit organizations and being able to use this data to do their own intelligence and sense-making about their communities, combine it with their own data where that's appropriate, 
to suggest data sources where none exists. And what, where we would like to go with this in the first part is creating some communities of practice that allow us to come together around some specific issue areas so that we can support putting together some demonstration projects that say, okay, this is how a group of organizations did this around issues of incarceration, or this is how a group of organizations use this around food security. So we can set up some of these instances that Guha was referring to and provide training. Eli has shared now a couple of times the blog post where we talk about the project. This is really introducing data commons and the use of public data. And this project in that blog post, there's a simple way for you to add yourself to the list and we'll keep you involved and engaged as we keep going through it. Of course, we will have others of these kinds of webinars as we develop more and have more tools to be able to share with you. We'll look at developing trainings and other resources that support your use of it over time. But in general, please don't hesitate to, to reach out and engage with us in the participation of this. And we have just a couple more minutes. So I'll just look and see if there are any trailing questions in here. I do the for us. There's in the, the blog post, there's a listserv essentially to subscribe to. And we'll keep you all more posted up to date as we go through it. And we'll also be sharing it on the TechSoup blog and you know, social media panels and other webinars like this one. So that won't be the only mechanism for finding out about this project. In the meantime, I hope you'll all leave, run right away to datacommons.org and start to play with it a little bit and start thinking about how you might use it because that is the support that we want to be able to provide over time. I know Andrew has just shared the survey. It's always wonderful for us to get feedback because Guha told my colleagues and I on one of our early conversations, good feedback is wonderful, feels awesome, but bad feedback is actionable. So feel free to give us all your feedback to tell us how we can make both the webinar better, but also make this kind of information more accessible and usable to you. So thank you all very much for participating. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Yes. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.